Welcome everybody to the Tools of the Trade, Benefit Accounting of Nature-Based Solutions. The lack of standardized approaches to effectively identify, quantify, and value the potential benefits of nature-based solutions has been a hurdle to mainstream public and private sector investment in the implementation. This, sec this session, rather, will showcase innovative tools that can support the business case for nature-based solution investment and allow companies to make informed decisions regarding water security, climate resilience, biodiversity conservation, and socioeconomic advancements. Today, we have presenters from the Swedish International Development Corporation, CEDA, Limnitech, Denkstadt, the Coca-Cola Company, Ecometrics, and the Nature Conservancy. I wish all of our speakers and presenters well. We will start off with a welcome from CEDA, followed by three teams who will present on different NBS tools. We have then got half an hour of a Q&A session, and uh, we ask that you pose your questions in the pathable chat function uh, during the session, and we'll try and answer as many of these as possible. Finally, we'll have a wrap up and then a close of the session. We really hope that you enjoyed this session. We've had a lot of fun putting the presentations together. So Cecilia, over to you for the official opening of the session. Cecilia, if you could unmute, please. Okay. Thank you, Greg. Ladies and gentlemen, good morning, good afternoon, good evening, wherever you are. I once again would like warmly welcome you, all of you who have joined this session uh, to enjoy what we are going to listen to. Greg, you made an, a fantastic introduction. The name of this session is Tools of the Trade, Benefit Accounting of Nature-Based Solutions. And my name is Cecilia Sharp and I'm Assistant Director General of uh, Swedish CEDA. I think we're all in agreement uh, that we are currently facing severe crisis. This is manifested through uh, wildfires, floods and droughts, loss of biodiversity, not sparing any corner of the globe. And I hope we all have become clear that we need to tackle the planetary crisis jointly and that actions must be accelerated now. Nature-based solutions or in short NBS, have emerged as one plausible option to ensure multiple benefits in, for example, managing climate resilience, biodiversity, water security, water quality, as well as providing social benefits. Hence, the NBS can address key social and environmental challenges. But do we have the evidence that it works? And can benefits be valued and estimated to catalyze investments? Rest assured, this session on NBS uh, benefit accounting will provide some of the answers at least. It will showcase very innovative tools that can support private sector as well as public actors to understand and value NBS. By identifying, accounting for, and valuing NBS benefits, different actors from using this tool will be able to make informed uh, investment decisions for climate change and biodiversity pers from perspectives, but also, of course, from a social and economic perspective. And I am proud that CEDA has been one of the funders supporting the development of the tool to be presented by Limnotech today. In addition to uh, the value and aspect, for the NB NBS concept to really take off, other ob obstacles must also be overcome. And the power of nature-based solutions need to be brought into the policy and practice arena and agendas to be considered both by public and private sectors. Last but not least, if we're serious about the sustainability of NBS, it is essential to put humans at the center of the benefits uh, the voices of the community, especially women, have to be heard and included in the design and implementation of MBS. This is to ensure that human well-being is taken care of in addition to nature's well-being. With these few words, this session is officially open and I will hand over to the speakers Wendy and Tim from Limnotech. Thank you and I really hope you will enjoy this innovative and interesting session. The screen is yours. Thank you, Cecilia, and thank you, CETA, for funding this, this work. I'm going to provide a brief overview of the project that this tool is related to, and then turn it over to Tim to dive into the details. 
The NBS Benefits Explorer was developed through a collaboration between the CEO Water Mandate, Pacific Institute, the Nature Conservancy, Danone, and Limnotech. Next slide. Nature-based solutions, or NBS, have the potential to deliver sustainable improvements in watershed health and multiple benefits, but scaled implementation remains limited due to several challenges and barriers. Although all of these are important, this project aims to tackle the last point on this list, a lack of a standardized approach to identify and account for the benefits accrued from investments in NBS. By addressing this barrier, as well as speaking to the others on this list, we're hoping to build the business case for NBS. Next slide. Our project is developing a standardized method, guide, and tool to account for the stacked water, carbon, biodiversity, and socioeconomic benefits of NBS for watersheds. Uh, this, as shown in this graphic, there are four key outcomes from the project. A year ago, uh, we published a landscape assessment that informed the path of the project by exploring the concepts, definitions, and classifications of NBS and identified barriers and opportunities to scale. It also reviewed available methods for evaluating and measuring and demonstrating the value of NBS benefits. The method we developed refers to a stepwise process that can support the identification of stacked benefits and identify wider socioeconomic benefits of NBS. Uh, the recently published guide presents practical guidance on how to use the developed method to identify NBS benefits. And then finally, the tool that we're presenting on today is a user-friendly online platform that adopts the developed method and guidance to support benefit identification and accounting. And the URL on this slide indicates where you can find more information. Next slide, the guide presents a four-step method to support practitioners in identifying the benefits from MBS across the design and implementation phases of MBS projects. You can see the four steps indicated here. Um, first, identify the environmental and societal challenges. Secondly, identify available habitat and intervention types. Third, identify activities that improve natural processes. And then finally, identify benefits and trade-offs. As indicated by the green arrow, it is crucial that stakeholders are engaged from the onset of the project. And similarly, as the yellow, indicate, yellow arrow indicates, data collection should start during the design phase and continue throughout the subsequent project phases. Uh, the image on the right is the guide that I mentioned that we released recently, uh, with, and you can see the, uh, the link to access that PDF. So with that, I will turn it over to Tim Decker and he'll uh, provide some information on uh, more details on the, on the tool. Thanks, Wendy. Um, yeah, so the, the tool is the, is the fourth step in the process that Wendy outlined. And we, we really focused on developing an application that could be used uh, very simply to understand the linkage between activities that are undertaken uh, in a particular habitat and the benefits that they generate. So um, the upfront part of the tool uh, it is a three-step process. It, it asks the question, what are you looking to understand? Are you looking to understand what kinds of benefits an activity will generate or what kinds of um, activities you select might achieve certain benefits. So going from front to back or from back to front, thinking about how, how benefits and activities relate. Um, secondly, identifying a habitat that's relevant to the local project that you're trying to execute. And then thirdly, identifying one or, or multiple intervention types. And we considered management, restoration, protection, and creation as all uh, potential interventions to consider. So three simple steps. Um, we press the button and the Explorer updates, and then uh, it becomes a, a browsable and in, an interactive tool at that point. So um, this is the front page of the tool. The tool initiates with an overview of what the tool is. It gives some guidance as to how the tool can be used. It provides some important definitions about the benefits and the concepts relevant to NBS and provides access to the guide. Um, but what most people do uh, is to press the button on the upper right, which is explore the tool, which enables you to start um, to start going through that three-step process that I described a moment ago. Um, as I said, the steps are on the left. Step one is to identify the purpose 
Are you going from activities to benefits or are you thinking about benefits and how they relate back to activities? Secondly, um, select a habitat. And we have a set of, I think, nine different habitats that we're considering now. And thirdly, select an intervention or multiple interventions. So when you've done all that, you press the Update Explorer button at the top and the full range of activities that are relevant to this particular intervention and uh, habitat combination become available. They're, they're in the left panel on the screen here. Um, and then also what is shown are the processes, physical, chemical, and biological processes that these activities influence and the benefits that accrue as a result of executing these activities. So you've done steps one through three, you've got this panel open to you now. Um, the next step is to start clicking on activities on the left and seeing how they relate. So as an example, if you were to click on terraced contour planting here in, in a forest habitat with a management intervention, um, the processes that are affected are these, so trapping and retention, erosion control, flow interception, and the benefits that accrue um, show up in three different categories. Uh, the ones in the top are water-related benefits, the ones in the middle section here are water quality related, and then carbon benefits and biodiversity benefits. So for this particular example, we're seeing mostly um, water related benefits that emerge. Um, and then one thing that we heard from users of this tool uh, as we did the, the guide development process was that there was a desire to know how to actually begin to characterize those benefits in greater detail. So one of the features of the tool is click on a benefit that you've identified and very quickly be able to see what that benefit is, and then also what the indicators and methods that our team and a group of experts that we've consulted with uh, recommend as valid ways to characterize uh, those benefits. So that's the tool in a nutshell. I could spend a lot more time, but I don't have any more time. Um, some of the next steps that we plan uh, for this is further refinement and development of the tool and, and uh, further testing with critical users. Um, engagement with uh, stakeholder groups who might be interested in using the tool in different kinds of ways. We see an opportunity to create an expert interface, so a way to, for experts to use this tool and not just um, use it, but also uh, to provide input to it and add to the, uh, add to the detail. And uh, we'd like to expand in terms of method identification and spatial and temporal effects. So those are the next steps. These are the participants um, in the process. Uh, we had a great time working with Pacific Institute and Danone and the Nature Conservancy on this. Um, and the official launch is on September 9th. So th these are the details related to uh, a webinar that will be upcoming on the 9th of September. So with that, I will turn it over to the next speakers. Uh, Yvonne and Jan are gonna be talking about uh, natural capital that can accrue from NBS. Yeah, thank you, Tim. Um, I will start sharing my screen. And go to presentation mode. Yeah, hopefully you can see my screen now. So uh, thanks, everybody. Um, welcome also from myself. I'm Jan Burger from Coca-Cola Company. And I'm together with Ivan from Denkstad. We'd like to share with you some experience we had with uh, nature-based solutions um, and how to calculate the natural capital benefits from them. So uh, before I start, I, I want to um, stress first that the nature-based solutions work is, is stemming from our uh, water strategy, our global uh, water uh, strategy framework and the replenishment. So compensating the water we use in our products is, is at the main at the heart of it. Uh, we already committed in 2004 to replenish 100% of our water. And we reached that target already in 2015, and globally we are now at 170%, and in Europe even at 240%. And when we looked at those water replenishment um, projects, we uh, felt that there was also more benefits to them. And we wanted to know more about those benefits and uh, particularly how you can calculate them in order to uh, uh, select projects for the future and also to align uh, our water replenishment work with other uh, sustainability commitments uh, like, uh, for instance, um, 
decreasing of our uh, carbon emissions and compensating for them and also prepare for the future where uh, things might evolve in like from the task force on nature based solutions financial disclosure and the science uh, uh, based targets for uh, nature. Uh, now I'll hand over to Ivan to uh, take you through more in detail the methodology. Uh, thank you, Jan. You should hopefully all be able to hear me. I did have some audio issues before. Great. Okay, so valuing more than water. Um, as Jan said, Coca-Cola has traditionally focused uh, when it comes to investing in nature on water. And you know that makes sense for them. It's great. It's not going to change. But actually, um, taking this relatively narrow view potentially ignores a lot of the other benefits we can get from investing in nature. And you all know that uh, those benefits can be quite um, varied. And as you saw in the tool, the MBS tool just before, it's quite a big list. Okay. What we've done is we've uh, evaluated Coca-Cola's nature investment portfolio, and we've um, identified seven key, reasonably broadly defined benefits to do with water quantity and quality, flood protection, carbon sequestration, recreational benefits, food and raw material benefits, and also biodiversity. Um, and then what we need to understand is all of these have real economic value. Um, it's either through cost avoidance or through supporting farmers because they need water to grow their crops, through avoiding the damages of climate change. All of these have real tangible economic value. Um, which would be really useful for us to know because we are investing, so maybe we want to know how much we get back. How do we begin to do this? We need a methodology. In the middle, we have a typical what we call a decision tree. Um, basically, first, in order to figure out the economic value, you need to figure out what happens in nature. If you plant a forest, if you restore a wetland, how much CO2 gets sucked up into the ground, how much water do you restore, how many new tourists do you get in the area, all these sorts of things. Only then can you begin to actually put a value on nature. The way we do this, on the rightmost side, basically we have uh, some recommended methodologies that are essentially some Excel sheets. Um, it's, it's meant to be a tool that is easy enough to use for non-specialists uh, or, or for people that have other things to do, like actually restoring nature and not you know, being in front of a computer with a PhD in economics trying to figure out the economic value. Um, and it's meant to be both something that you can use before a project to figure out what the benefits may be, and also after a project to figure out what the benefits actually were once you're done. Okay, it's not a planning tool, it's not a design tool. Um, as you saw, the NBS Explorer is a great tool to figure out how to actually measure things on the ground. And then also there are plenty of tools to actually plan your project, you know, what you should include, what you should exclude, all these sorts of things. Ours is about evaluating and calculating the benefits. Okay. Next slide, please. Um, to figure out now um, how, to, how we can actually build natural capital for nature-based solutions, here is a typical Coca-Cola project. Um, on the left, we have Ionia, Europe's fifth largest peat bog, nature reserve, huge store of carbon. But unfortunately, it looks like uh, what we have on the top picture, drained because of some irrigation canals, some dams that are no longer used, but historically were there. And what Coca-Cola did is they invested some money, they removed the dams, and now the ecosystem looks like on the bottom picture. So a nice, pristine looking ecosystem. What we do on the top right, we record all of these benefits, the water we replenish, the CO2 that gets sucked up in the ground and remains there, uh, maybe other benefits like fire avoidance or biodiversity visitors to this nice, pristine nature reserve. And we can use this information and put an economic value to actually develop a return on investment sort of indicator. In this case, Coca-Cola invested something like 300,000 euro, and through the economic benefits that we get for society, we get almost 1 million euro per year of benefits that accrue from this investment, which is a pretty good return on investment, yeah? It's a really good way to talk to your financial manager, which actually brings me to our next slide, um, which is really, so what? What can we do with this sort of methodology? Um, on the x-axis on this graphic, we have investments. On the y-axis, we have the value to society if these projects were to persist for 10 years. And what Coca-Cola do is they actually go and they audit these projects that they invest in to figure out that, well, they're still there and we can still count the benefits. And what we found through piloting is three essential things. Number one, the bigger the investment in nature, the bigger the benefits for society. You know, the more money we put in, if we do our work properly, the more value to society we get in the end. Um, no, pretty simple message. 
But actually, some of the projects, um, as, the, as the project I showed you on the last slide, um, they are for a relatively small investment. We can get a disproportionately huge benefit for society. And why is this? Well, what we figured out is because when you have a really degraded ecosystem, there is plenty to fix. Um, even with a relatively small investment, if you do your work right, you can have a potentially really big benefit. Um, and I mean, we all know there's plenty of ecosystems out there that are probably in dire need of investing. So, you know, there's probably a huge potential out there to, you know, to do good and to uh, gain some value through investing in nature. Finally, we have some projects that don't seem to yield as good of a return on investment as we originally think. But there we figured out actually is because we're not necessarily measuring what we're supposed to be measuring in this context. Because social benefits that stem from some projects such as capacity building, influencing policy makers, um, educational benefits, other social benefits, they're difficult to measure in economic terms, but it doesn't mean they're not important. So we always caution um, our users of this method and all natural capital practitioners that uh, we should not use economic value to devolve things into a, into a purely return on investment indicator. That would be reductionist and it would actually mislead us. We need to evaluate projects in their entirety. Um, so economic valuation useful, but also we should always remember the context. Okay. Um, and Jan will share some next steps. I mean, I can talk yep. about this all day, but you know, only so much time. Yeah. Uh, in terms of next steps, what we uh, are planning to do is to roll out this methodology across our portfolio of projects that we have in Europe, but also outside of Europe. And then at the same time, we, we know we have to improve the measurement uh, method for biodiversity uh, further. And also we would like to build uh, the comprehensive understanding of the benefits uh, like um, uh, for our business and particularly on the, uh, the element for climate. And uh, last but not least, we, we also want to continue to contribute to the uh, natural-based solutions discussions um, and uh, engage with our partners and other stakeholders to, to have this uh, discussion about uh, valuing nature and what that could mean for business. So to close it off, um, here you can find our um, details and also uh, please check out the report that you can find on our website. You can find the link at the bottom of the page in the presentation. Thanks again and I hand over to the next speaker. Thank you. Well, good afternoon. My name is uh, Ed Pinero with Ecometrics LLC. So the Ecometrics team is the keeper of the Ecometrics methodology, and we have been participating in the CEO Water Mandate Nature-Based Solutions Advisory Group uh, in development of this of the material that you have seen. As we will hear from my colleague Hara El Assad, uh, Ecometrics is a comprehensive and robust methodology specifically designed for nature-based solutions efforts or projects that leverage nature-based solutions. Our tool measures and values environmental, economic, and social co-benefits of a project or an activity. We work with all types of organizations wishing to do these types of analyses, mainly in order to be able to make a compelling business case for nature-based solutions. Our results can be independently reviewed, validated, and certified. And we have aligned our methodology with various international protocols, uh, such as the carbon registries, as well as several other standards uh, including the Alliance for Water Stewardship uh, standard. So to get into more detail, I'm going to hand it over to my colleague, Hada. Hi, sorry, can everyone hear me? Not my smoothest or most elegant transition, <laughs> but I'm happy to be here. Uh, thanks for listening to our story. Um, like Ed said, Ecometrics um, is a tool and I'm going to break it down a little bit for you. At its simplest form, Ecometrics does this. It's a methodology that identifies, quantifies and values in monetary term, all environmental, economic, uh, social co-benefits or outcomes of projects applying NDS. 
a key point is that an outcome is not necessarily an output. It, it's the impact or change that is as a, that is a result of that project. So for example, for a reforestation project, the output is more trees, but the outcome is actually what happens as a result of the increased number of trees. And these outcomes can be both, both positive and negative. And it's really important that we do our due diligence and capture both here. So what is it exactly? The, it's really a combination of two different things. Uh, the first being consultative work, meaning people actually collecting information, designing what goes into the methodology, and then interpreting the outputs and results. And secondly, it's a cloud-based platform that calculates the results based on the human input. So essentially, the people do the thinking and the online tool does the math. It's important to note that it doesn't operate in a way that anyone anywhere can log in and run the analysis themselves. And the reason why is because there's very specific thought processes involved and a certain level of expertise that goes into deciding what is appropriate to feed the platform, not just to make it work, but to really maintain the level of credibility required for these types of reportings. On the human side, the work consists of upfront research and data gathering to establish different reference points, parameters, formula, robust quantification methodologies, financial proxies. It's a pretty long list, but, but essentially what these are are the equations, variables, and constants that we need to translate an identified outcome into a monetary value. And this is really where we combine a combination of peer-reviewed research, scientific and engineering principles, and very critical context-specific points of reference in the platform. For example, what equations am I going to use to calculate carbon sequestration? Or what financial analyses am I going to use to determine the value of water quality improvement? Also in parallel, there's a significant stakeholder involvement and engagement in order to support and validate our assumptions. And finally, we use this cloud-based platform to do the calculations and generate the results that are inherently customizable for any given project site uh, that's in question. So it is really this ideal coupling of human and computing power. And the reason why we built it this way is because as you can imagine, and some of our co-presenters alluded to, things can get pretty busy in terms of how many outcomes there are in consideration. Outcomes can have multiple benefits and benefits can have multiple stakeholders and so on. So we really needed a framework to keep things not only organized, but thoughtfully integrated so that we can capture these really nuanced cross effects between different parameters and outcomes. Also something really important to consider are ever changing variables, such as taking into account net present value or making corrections for variables like maturing vegetation. In the context of carbon sequestration, for example, the age and maturity of trees clearly impacts its, abil its ability to sequester carbon. And you have to correct for that every year that the tree is growing. These are the sorts of things that we already bake into our platform. And this is what makes Ecometrics really more than a calculator, calculator. It's really a robust analysis methodology and tool. So Ecometrics can be used for both forecasting, such as scenario planning, predictive assessments, as well as for evaluated purposes. Um, you know, either to assess current performance, possibly against a baseline or a reference point, and then also impacts that might arise on longer timeframes. In essence, this approach can be applied to any project stage from conception to completion and even beyond. I wanted to take a moment to show you what the outputs look like from our system. Um, the inputs typically include information on site characteristics, stakeholder types, and the defined outputs of the project. And these outcomes are then quantified and valued in monetary terms and represented as they relate to specific stakeholders. So in other words, Ecometrics will tell you the value of a given outcome and to which stakeholder it represents. In this reforestation project example, the environment, which we consider as its own stakeholder, benefits from erosion control, while the funder benefits from the market value of nitrogen offset while the community benefits from enhanced storm storage protection. And this system provides many ways to present this type of information. Uh, this slide is just another variation of how we can do that. 
This in one in particular shows the percent of total value created as it relates to these different stakeholder types. And now I'm gonna hand it over to Ed again to continue our discussion. Excellent, thank you, Hara. So as you heard, Ecometrics addresses uh, all aspects of nature-based solutions evaluation, and it uses a very strong stakeholder engagement component in conjunction with that rigorous data collection and independent review to help validate the analysis. And, and this valuation process really is what helps make for a strong business case uh, to, to support nature-based solutions as, as an answer. Can you go to the next slide? Uh, so it, as, as you can see, it is capable of a full start to finish analysis for NBS, but it is also adaptable and therefore you could start it, it fits anywhere within the NBS journey. So with that in mind, considering this, the, uh, the, the Explorer tool that we just heard about earlier, our net, one of our next steps is to continue working with the working group to explore how to integrate Ecometrics so a user can move seamlessly from the framework to the more detailed quantification and valuation elements that can be done by Ecometrics. So on that note, we're done. Thank you very much for your time and attention and happy to answer any questions uh, during the Q&A. So Nabia, back to you. Thank you so much, Ed and Hada, and thank you all for joining this session today. We're now moving into the question and answer portion for the next 25 minutes or so. Um, and it's a pleasure to be with you today to talk about these tools related to nature-based solutions. My name is Nabia Ofosuama. I'm with the Nature Conservancy. I support our work on corporate engagement in water. And I'm just gonna be facilitating this session. So we have one question that's come in through the Pathable chat and I encourage others to please add more questions uh, onto that platform. So where you first signed into the session, there's a chat box there. Please enter any questions that you have into that area. Um, this question is for Jan at Coca-Cola. Uh, do I understand correctly that Coca-Cola's replenishment activities are not directly related geographically to where the inputs are sourced through its supply chain? And hence, they're separate activities that are not embedded in the supply chain. So Jan, can you, can you cover yep. that question in terms of where the projects are taking place? Yeah, so uh, indeed, the, the past projects were um, more or less randomly selected and not always related to the, to the places where we actually use the water, so our bottling facilities. But with our new 2030 um, water strategy, um, we have changed the approach for our replenishment projects and now they are um, uh, going to be targeted in the locations where we use water um, for our bottling operations but and also in the situations where there is uh, a high water stress. And um, we are looking at projects that are in sourcing regions uh, for our primary ingredients um, where also uh, a water stress situation can be uh, the case. So we are focusing our replenishment work now um, uh, on the, the location where it matters the most. Great, thank you for that, Jan. So I'll keep the questions related to um, that first presentation. So a question for you, Yvonne. Um, can you talk about what advice you would give to users who are starting out to choose among the many tools and methods that are out there? Um, sure, yes. Uh, it is definitely a challenging space. Uh, at the same time, we have so many tools seemingly out there, but people always you know, come, come to us and say, how do we do these things? Surely if you know, the tools are good enough or comprehensive enough or easily easy enough to understand. People should be able to do this mostly by themselves. Um, what we find is there's a lot of, um, of shall we say, a real software term, a lot of closed source tools out there. So, you know, you get a black box and you're supposed to put in some things and numbers comes out, come out, but that's not necessarily helpful if you want to understand what's happening. And, you know, if I'm a sustainability manager or, and, you know, this is what we, we get from talking to clients. They really want to understand the why they get certain results. Um, so what we've been trying to do with our tools is, as I said, it's Excel sheets. All the numbers are there. Um, you know, the sources are there. You can look at them. You can scrutinize them. Um, and, you know, if you don't like them, you can even change them. 
and there's you no know, there we have no problem with this and there's we feel there's value to this because then you can you can actually figure out what's happening behind the scenes and you can judge for yourself can i trust this can i improve and should i improve it can i improve it etc Great, thank you for that, Ivan. Um, moving to Tim and Wendy at Limnotech, can you say more about how the tool could be expanded in the future? Um, I can I can start on that, and I can let Wendy jump in a, a little bit as well. Um, you know, one one of the things that we think is is really important here is um, is capturing expert input because the the world of NBS uh, really in, involves expertise from just a, a host. Of experts all around the world, and um, one of the things that we see as as being uh, a real benefit of what we're putting together is um, for it to serve as a framework uh, for a place where those ex experts can come in and where they can add more information, where they can they can sort of weigh in on what they see as critical linkages between activities, between physical, chemical, biological processes. Um, and the benefits that they accrue, and then the methods that are appropriate for measuring those benefits. So um, we've, we've made, I think, a, a pretty substantial start on that. Um, but, you know, it's, it's a big world of, uh, of possible um, actions and interventions and NBS uh, techniques. And um, we'd love to see it become something that, that evolves in that way with lots of input. So, and Wendy, if you wanted to add anything, I'll, I'll let you talk. Yeah, I I would really like to see it go in that direction if we have the the resources to do so, and uh, it it allows for a very transparent um, uh, process. Anyone can see the underworkings of the tool and contribute to them. So, um, yeah, that would be really terrific. Great, thanks, Wendy and Tim, and I think that's similar to what Yvonne said before about you know having those spreadsheets available having people able to able to see what's behind them and um, adding to that backup data to make sure that it can be adapted so some commonalities there um, so moving to the ecometrics tool um, for ed and huda with such a strong stakeholder engagement element component of ecometrics as a way to gather information how do you deal with environment related benefits uh, it's a very good question uh we consider the, as Hada mentioned, we consider the environment a stakeholder. So when we talk about uh, capturing stakeholder, what's important to the stakeholder, what issues are relevant in a given project situation or whatever, and how do we attribute value when we try to figure out what, which kind of value is created, we are considering the environment as one of those stakeholders. So that's why um, we, we, we look at, we quantify, we value those benefits associated there. Sometimes a benefit to the environment as a stakeholder is manifests itself as kind of a secondary benefit to another kind of a stakeholder. You know, so biodiversity, for example, is a benefit to the environment as a stakeholder because it increases biodiversity. There's more species or more of a species that can, that can be in, uh, as a result of the project. That in turn can have benefits for other stakeholders, like the local community in terms of recreation and so on and so forth. So that's why that's how we fit the environment into the stakeholder picture. Thanks, Ed. I don't know if you have anything to add there. Yeah, I, I think, you know, to what Ed was saying, there's a, a huge need, I think, to make the environment its own entity and its own stakeholder. And I think that overlooking the environment as its own entity, and as opposed to something that just receives impact, um, is really important. And I think that that's really more of a, a mental shift for the people that are creating that sort of impact. Great. Thanks for that. I'm, I'm just curious, uh, Ivan and Jan, if that sort of thinking has come into your uh, your work as well, considering the environment as a stakeholder in and of itself, and maybe that could address some of those questions that you had, Yvonne, earlier about, you know, some of those, those benefits that may not have seemed as high, but you need to consider that context as well. So any thoughts on that? Uh, no, that's an interesting, uh, interesting approach. You know, I learned a lot um, Ed and Hader are doing, you know, as we speak. Um, well, our, our perspective is, I guess, slightly more um, orthodox. It's uh, we take the environment as in, uh, the environment is something that you improve and then, you know, the benefits that come out of it 
go become bigger, more or less. You know, this is the, the simplified version. You fix the environment, the environment gives you some benefits, and so now some more benefits can come out to the economy or to whomever. Um, I'm not really given this, this much thought, but it's definitely an interesting way to present this, or at least to put the environment on equal footing as everybody else, which in the end of the day is what we should all be doing. Um, making the environment as important as everything else in decision making and especially in economic decision making so that we can actually well invest where the big benefits actually are. Thank you, Ivan. And Limnotech, just curious your thoughts on that one as well uh, in terms of kind of making the environment a stakeholder. I, I, I also really like that approach, and, and I think that that kind of thinking, the, the, the idea of the environment as kind of a, a participant around the table, a big stakeholder, <laughs> um, was kind of implicit to a lot of the discussions that we had as, as the team about which benefits belong over on, on the right side of, of the tool. Um, we talked about a lot of different kinds of benefits, and um, ma many of them have are, are things that you can tie directly to human human use and human experience, but many of them really aren't. Many of them are just sort of implicitly benefits to nature and to natural function. And I, I think, you know, if you even take it one step further back, um, the, the middle part of our tool, the thing that links activities and benefits is, is this piece that talks about physical, chemical, and biological processes. So, our tool is inherently functionally defined, and those functions are, are processes that occur in nature. So um, really everything that, that we did kind of goes through that filter and thinks about kind of the inherent value of those functions um, as, as a way to get from activity to benefit. So I think to me, that seems like a, a sensible way to think about it. Um, but yeah, I, I, I love the idea of, of the benefit column always being thought of in terms of human benefits, but natural benefits um, kind of hand in hand as, as co-stakeholders really. It's also starting to show up in, uh, in US case law. <laughs> yeah. Um, there are, uh, there are, there are um, suits that are popping up in which uh, nature has a, has a role as an entity in, in lawsuits. So <laughs> it's popping up in other places as well. That's great. Thanks, Tim. So there, there's a question that we have um, from CETA thinking about the IUCN global standard on NBS that was launched in 2020 states that all NBS, in addition to addressing different societal challenges, should simultaneously be providing human well being and biodiversity benefits. So this question is really for anyone, uh, to what extent are the tools presented aligned with this standard? So I start. Sure, yeah, go ahead. Sure, so what we've been doing with Coca-Cola, as I said, it's not a planning tool, it's an evaluation tool. So it's sort of at the, uh, at the end of the, of the nature-based solutions uh, standards that IUCN has. Um, implicitly, when we developed this, this was because um, Coca-Cola's uh, project partners, which are typically big NGOs, including, for example, the Nature Conservancy, um, they already have to assess the benefits to do with water um, from their projects and report them to Coca-Cola. So our thinking was, no, they already know how to structure a project, more or less. They know how to figure out at least some of the benefits. We need to help them figure out the non-water benefits and figure and help them figure out the value that was the need there from you no know, coke stakeholders but we should definitely recognize that not everybody knows how to develop a nature-based solution project so definitely you know something like a global guide that asks what the IUCN have done is definitely very valuable in order to be able to you know, properly figure out how to do such a project so that we actually get the natural benefits we want at the end of the project that we're doing Great. Thanks, Yvonne. Others on how the tool aligns with the IUCN international standard and thinking about both societal challenges uh, and biodiversity benefits? Uh, just from our standpoint, um, we, when Huda described how we collect our information, so we, re we refer to all of these higher level protocols. So um, the uh, natural capital protocols, 
we, but we also look at social value, international protocols, uh, and, and a series of and many others so that our concepts, the way we're interpreting and the way we're setting up a project to walk through that identify, quantify, and value benefit is informed by all these higher level protocols. But we also come at it from the bottom. So that's what the stakeholder engagement also comes in to really give us that place-based um, insight and input to be able to figure out what kind of what we're doing. And we need to do that because at a very high level, you can look at what you know the global implications are of valuing nature-based solutions. But those numbers change quite a bit depending on the very specific situation that you're dealing with, a specific watershed, a specific um, region, a, a type of project. So we have to correct for that. So it's kind of a mixing of the, of the concepts. Thanks, Ed. Any other thoughts on that one? I'll, I'll also just jump in and say that the, uh, the IUCN standard was very much on our minds when we developed um, bo both the tool, but also the, um, the benefit accounting for nature-based solutions uh, guide as well. I mean, that was, that was kind of a place that we started. Um, the idea of making those linkages between activities and processes and benefits really kind of originated from that IUCN definition. Um, and in much of the work that's, that's described in the guide, uh, it describes how those benefits are broken out across um, water, water quality, carbon, um, biodiversity, uh, but also social and, and cultural benefits. And the tool, um, the tool captures the first set. It, it captures water, water quality, carbon, and biodiversity. Um, but we definitely see uh, expanding into social and cultural benefits as, as an important next step as well. Great, thank you, Tim. We have a couple more questions that have come in through the Pathable chat. One is for Jan. Um, can you talk about what opportunities you see for NBS as countries and governments are looking for partners to address climate change, especially with the latest IPCC report? Yeah, we, uh, we have seen in, in, in many of our water replenishment projects that uh, when you're talking about, for instance, uh, wetland restoration, that um, those projects typically also have a lot of um, climate benefits. So not only capturing carbon, but also uh, uh, climate amortization. So uh, making sure that you store more water that can help preventing floods, for instance, but also uh, storing of water to keep that for uh, drier periods of time that, be, that might be more prolonged due to climate change. So yes, water is, a, um, of course, a very important factor when it comes to the effects of climate change, either by having more droughts, more severe weather um, incidents uh, with floods, uh, for instance. And um, yeah, we, we, definitely, we definitely think that the nature-based solutions can play an important role there. So that's why we are keen to explore the, the value, not only for water, where they were intended for primarily, but particularly also for climate and climate adaptation. Thank you, Jan. And I know Tim mentioned those were included in um, that, that MDS Benefits Explorer tool and Ecometrics is also looking at those. So I think those opportunities to showcase both the climate mitigation and adaptation potential um, of NBS and maybe raise that profile a little bit um, with so much attention on that issue. We have another question um, that I'll, I'll offer to Hudda first. Um, how would you convince people, donors, regulators, et cetera, that the environment is also a stakeholder? So I'm sure Ecometrics has some experience with this in your work. That's a tough one, <laughs> convincing people to do anything really. Um, it, I think it's, I think at this point, uh, I don't think people need convincing. I think that it's pretty obvious that, you know, that we're all kind of on a, you know, I think the damage has been done and, and we're still doing it. So I think anyone that needs more convincing, um, it's, you know, I, I don't think there are many people out there, I hope. Uh, but what really I think it comes down to is, is the economics. Um, and, you know, I, I think that, you know, that 
the numbers really do speak for themselves. If, if you were to take a, a, a any project scope, you know, and, and you really had a well thought out uh, environmental approach, for the most part, you know, they, they always end up positive. And I'll let Ed elaborate on this a little bit um, as far as how the tool itself might help in that convincing. So Ed, do you wanna hop in? Yeah, and that's actually how to put it very nicely. And that is the concept is not the challenge. It's the taking that additional step and seeing the, seeing that there's a business case for that. And I don't wanna, we don't wanna make it sound like we're cheapening everything to you know dollars and cents. But the common language across a lot of outcomes, a lot of benefits, whether it's uh, environmental benefits, social benefits, coastal resilience, carbon sequestration, when you're looking at all of these different things and you're trying to compare and make a case and see what, how to prioritize, there's only a very few common parameters you can use. And monetization is one of those. You know, the ability to, to speak of these things in terms of mon monetary terms allows for these kind of comparisons. Um, so the way we convince, if you want to say, if you want to use that term, convince folks that the environment is a stakeholder, although we've never had any pushback on that from our Ecometrics users, uh, the big the, the issue becomes, I understand that and I recognize that. How do how is that valuation, that value that we're creating for the environment in my best interest as well? And that's why we look at the value created for the environment as a stakeholder. And then the environment and how that then relates to other stakeholders. So you have kind of a double benefit, environment benefits as do other stakeholders because of that interdependency with the environment. Thanks, Ed. Um, anybody else want to weigh in on that one? Just a thought that I could I could throw in, Nabia, that, and maybe this is a little bit philosophical. <laughs> But you know, in thinking about how to convince people that the environment's a stakeholder, um, one thing that I think we've seen over here over the years has been that, that there's been a real evolution in people's thinking about what the environment e even is and what our relationship is with it. And uh, you know, of course, we all know that historically we were we were users of nature essentially, and we viewed nature as as a resource. Um, and then uh, I think we all gave ourselves a lot of credit for for um, evolving from that standpoint. And thinking of ourselves as caretakers of nature. Um, but I think what we've got going on now is moving to a next level again, where it's not about being caretakers of nature, it's about being essentially on a peer level with nature, thinking about nature as a as a stakeholder on, on a par with our own interests and essentially having having a relationship with with nature. That's a, that's a peer type of relationship. To me, um, that's that's kind of what defines it. I think that was in the background as we were developing this tool was thinking about, you know, how would we treat that stakeholder, that that peer appropriately? Um, and for, for me, that's just a helpful way to think about it. So Navia, maybe just to, to tail end on that, you know, it convincing is an interesting word. Um, and when I think about what really convinces me to do things um, as opposed to other things. It's really, you know, do I have the information? And as we're seeing with, with a lot of these tools, there's a lot of information out there that we need to digest. And what these tools use or do is really organize and, and make that information easier to digest. So I guess you really could see these as convincing tools in, in that sense. Yeah, thanks for that, Heather. I think we have time for maybe one more question. Um, and I'll, I'll offer this to Wendy first and see if others have thoughts. This question from Sita. In what way do the tools presented here ensure the involvement of, of local communities and that their voice is taken into consideration in the design, implementation, and follow-up of the NDS? That's a good question, Navia. Uh, for the local community, the, the NDS Explorer tool was designed primarily for private sector practitioners, but also we hope that it will be used by other stakeholders, investors, and municipalities, anyone that's interested in this type of a tool. Um, I, I think we've got a ways to go. I mean, these are, uh, these are not out there right now. Um, we're just releasing the MBS Explorer tool, hoping to expand on it. Um, I, I guess I'd put it back on Ecometrics, how available the Ecometrics 
uh, tool is available to um, communities to use. And, um, uh, it, but it's, I think it's a little premature to say for the NBS Explorer since we're, we're it's not even really out there yet. Um, I don't know, I don't wanna put you on the spot, Ed, but I think it's, um, our, our community is able to access the tool if they wanna leverage its power. Yeah, yeah, and it's actually designed uh, to be used by any kind of organization. And we're actually working on uh, working on and going to be working on projects that are done for not companies. So we, we do them for the, the, the typical big industry company, but mm -hmm. we're also doing it for, um, you know, a preservation kind of groups, uh, groups that are, you know, that might be focused on some specific natural ap attribute, whether it's habitat creation, pollinators, and so on, as well as the actual communities. Um, uh, you know, for example, maybe, uh, and this is also uh, proprietary now, but, but we're, you know, looking with, looking with at a, a city who's interested in setting up some kind of a, 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 a environmental quality credits kind of a thing. Um, and they, be, they then become the primary player. But I, I, I would be remiss if I didn't drive home this really important point about ecometrics. And that is no matter who's actually doing the project, it doesn't work if we don't have a comprehensive stakeholder engagement. So the community in concentric circles from people who are adjacent to the site all the way out through the, you know, through the county and the city and the local community, we consider all of those stakeholders. So everybody has, everybody in those circles have a, has a say in how we identify outcomes, benefits and value them, whether or not they're the actual trigger of the project. Uh, so. Great, thank you so much, Ed. Um, and thank you all so much for your responses. Someone puts in the chat, I love you guys, great answers. So really appreciate all of the work that you all have done, the great presentations that you gave today. Um, we heard some really interesting things in this Q&A section, um, talking about the ability to adapt these tools to what users needs. Um, also thinking about the opportunity to include the environment as a stakeholder, lots of robust discussion around that. Thinking about international standards being really helpful at setting out those frameworks, bringing more people to NBS, and then also having the tools to more deeply dive into what's happening locally. Um, and then thinking about NBS in the context of climate change and how we can think about the water benefits, but also those climate mitigation and adaptation benefits as well. So thank you all so much for this session uh, and for your participation. And I'll now hand it over to Elizabeth from CETA to close us out. Thank you. Thanks so much, Nabia. Um, a warm thanks to all the presenters and uh, participants uh, for your contribution to making this session so inspiring. I've learned a lot uh, and I hope that goes for the rest of you as well. Um, I especially enjoyed um, the uh, solutions and ac action oriented spirit um, and also this approach of treating the environment uh, as a stakeholder. That's really gonna be something that I take with me. Uh, so now we have the evidence of the value uh, of MBS. And we're also familiar with uh, some of the tools to account for and estimate the benefits of MBS. Um, so there's really no excuses for inaction. Um, and it's become clear that the MBS is an important part of the toolbox uh, to actually tackle the planetary crises that we're uh, facing uh, in terms of climate change, both mitigation and adaptation, the biodiversity crisis, as well as water security and water stress. Um, and not least providing uh, human well-being and, and other social benefits. Uh, I think that's really, really important to uh, make sure that the humans are still also uh, at the center of the MBS. So now, now the onus is on us uh, to make it happen and uh, build resilience faster, which is the hashtag for this uh, WWW. Um, so really great uh, with these few words. Uh, I hope you enjoy the rest uh, of this uh, week. And next year, I hope to see you uh, IRL in Stockholm. Uh, so thanks so much again and good night, uh, good afternoon, good evening, wherever you are. Thanks. Bye for now.